Okay, I'm just going to feel around a couple of things until I can find a, a, a groove here in the spirit for counsel or whatever. I have a couple of things I can fall back on. You know, we were talking yesterday about the victim mentality and how, uh, well, to rehearse it again, uh, the thieves on the cross, they were on there because they deserved to be there. Uh, somehow, a- as I said before, I don't want to belittle anyone who's been through a real trauma or whatever. I think there are real traumas. I think before we're saved, we're, we're victims. People take advantage of us. We get offended and trespassed against and for real. But And, and so I try to uh, qualify what I'm saying by saying that as Christians, we want to gradually mature out of that. A Christian is no longer a victim. Amen. Absolutely. And uh, no longer a victim. And to illustrate it, Jesus Christ was the atoning victim. And to put it in stark, simple, fundamental terms, if I am a victim, then I suffered something against myself wrongfully. But we know that we're born in sin and shaped in iniquity, and we can't say all our sufferings are unjust. We're, we're, we're in the flesh. We, we've transgressed. We've lived in our iniquity. And so... God God exacts of us less than our iniquity deserves. We all deserve to go to hell. So who is the only person ever to exist that suffered completely, totally, wrongfully because of nothing he did wrong? Who is the only person who suffered that? Jesus. He is the propitiation for our sins. Literally means the atoning victim. He did nothing wrong. As a matter of fact, if Jesus had done one thing wrong, committed one whatever. If, if, if he was uh, iniquitous or sinful in any way, shape, or form, then what God laid on him would have been just. But as we said before, the whole doctrine of atonement and that scripture that says, he that knew no sin became, became sin, sin that, we the that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. That God is doing this all very, very deliberately. That God has to deliberately throw the scales of judgment and justice off balance on purpose. Because God is getting ready and planning to do a thing that that at face value would be unjust. In other words, why should we, sinful, iniquitous creatures who deserve death and hell, right? It would not be fair for God to give us his righteousness because we don't deserve it. That would be an injustice. So the only way he can pull it off is to have another scapegoat, Jesus, suffer an injustice, being wholly righteous, but yet suffering for all everybody's sins. Well, that's an injustice against Jesus on a personal level. right? Jesus didn't sin that he deserved to face and, and bear the brunt of God's Wrath, hot wrath and displeasure against sin and iniquity. That's not fair. So it's like now God has to make it up to Jesus to balance the scales. Jesus suffered wrongfully, you might say, but not without purpose. Actually, it was the righteousness of God. It was to fulfill all righteousness. I'm just saying if you isolate Jesus as an individual man and take his crucifixion and his death out of the context of God's purpose as just a, a man... He, he, he didn't deserve it. So how's gonna, God going to make it right? Right. Well, Jesus is going to say he's going to plea for us now. Now Jesus has a bargaining chip with God at the throne. He said, yeah, God, Jonathan, he's a sinful man and da 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 and he's still grudging and complaining here and there and da 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 And he doesn't deserve the least of your righteousness. But I didn't do anything wrong and you put all this wrath on me and I didn't deserve it. So to make it right, give him your righteousness. See, it balances the scales. And that's the important part of forgiveness in terms of justice because he is faithful and just just to forgive your sins. So God's forgiving your your sins is an act of justice. It's not an act of our worthiness. It's not a condition of our worthiness. He, He owes it to Jesus. And that's why God, for Christ's sake, forgives our sins. So I was listening to, uh, I heard... uh, one of those high, higher profile um, internet preachers. Not, not, he's not an internet preacher, but he's on the internet. What was his name again? 
Yeah, John MacArthur. Yeah, John MacArthur. <laughs> well, he did. He, he made a statement. I don't really watch him. I don't know that much about him. But he uh, made a statement about the atonement, which is worth repeating. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah so those guys have a lot of blasphemies and the heresies. Jesus Christ, there was nothing to it. It was just like our blood. I'm telling you, this guy is so blasphemous. Oh, well, well, he did make a good statement right. about yeah, the atonement. Well, well, right. Okay, so well, maybe. <laughs> It was that, uh, okay, was Jesus Christ righteous? He who knew no sin, he was righteous. Right. Jesus Christ the righteous. Right. So, when God looked at him, when he was on the cross, he who knew no sin, he became sin. God looked at him, and all he saw was sin. Mm -hmm. If God saw anything righteous, he would have had to back off. So, I destroy the righteous with the wicked. You might look at, at a principle like that. He had to get Lot out of there and everything else. Well, the, the, the point is, is that the righteousness of Christ was hidden behind all the sin that he became. It's, it's, not, it, it's like an exchange. The, the reverse also becomes true. If you are walking in the light, right? If you are in the operation of God. If you are working out your salvation with fear and trembling, if you are striving against sin, if you are learning obedience by the things you suffer, if you are having fellowship with God and God's people, if you have received the Holy Ghost, if you are giving diligence, if you are pursuing holiness, if you are in that operation, mm -hmm. that's the blood of Jesus Christ, Amen. then when God looks at you, your life, your sinful life is hid. With Christ and God, God can see the purity of Jesus in you Amen. and receive you in all purity and fullness, just like he received Jesus. Even though you still have existing sins that haven't fully been worked out. Of course, th th there's qualifiers for this. You can't do this with provisional, presumptuous sin. You have to be in the life of Christ. You have to be uh, being led of the Spirit, the Holy Ghost. We liken the Holy Ghost to being like the spiritual blood. If physical, right? If physical blood in your body is the uh, if the flowing of physical blood carries all the nutrients and things that to the various organs and different parts of the body, it, it supplies everything the body needs. Everything the body needs, the supplier is the flow of blood. Life is in the blood. Life is in the blood, and it's the same in the spirit. Right. We are all different members of the body. It's the flowing of the Holy Ghost Absolutely. that distributes everything that to each member of the body, whatever they need to keep the whole body mm -hmm. edifying itself, alive, nurturing itself, Amen. in edifying itself in the love of God. So the Holy Ghost is the blood. Amen. Right. So if God sees you being led by the Holy Ghost in the cleansings, purgings, obedience, so forth, then he see your that's the blood. He sees, he sees Jesus. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, it's just something maybe other people, that for some reason I missed it somewhere down the line. I never correlated that, that just as uh, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Yeah, you, you, yeah, yeah, it does not yet appear. Yeah, we still have issues. We still have things to overcome. But if you're walking in that light, and you're maintaining and holding fast that which you have already attained and not mm -hmm. slipping. Yeah, right. Amen. God sees it all. He sees the operation oh, finished okay. and He sees you with the same oh, acceptance and purity that oh, He sees Jesus. Yeah. It's just like when He looked at Jesus, He did not see any of Jesus' righteousness. All He saw was sin and therefore He unleashed His wrath. Mm -hmm. Why has thou forsaken me? Right. My God, my God. Amen. And I'm not, I'm, I'm careful how I say this because I don't want to condone sin or anything. But no. likewise, if he looks at you and your sinful man is hid with Christ, mm -hmm. he sees Christ. That's how that works. Yeah, yeah. Because to a certain extent, you have to understand that kind of doctrine to be able to believe that God accepts you. Yes, right. 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 Especially uh, in the face of your own awareness of your shortcomings. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, there is a hypocrisy of flesh and there is a hypocrisy of spirit. 
hypocrisy of flesh is that, yes, I know I shouldn't grumble and complain, but I'm compelled and I'm, it's because I have this rest in my soul and I don't know where it's at yet. I haven't been healed and I don't, I'm, I'm trying to work this out. There's some root of bitterness somewhere and I don't know what it is. It's a mystery of iniquity. It has to be revealed. I'm trying to work it out. I'm confessing. I'm trying not to, you know, all that kind of stuff. Then you're Romans 7, the good I would, I would not, I did not, the evil that I would not, that I do. There is at least a will and a consciousness to acknowledge the truth and that you don't want to do this. There's a consciousness of it. But you're, for a season under under a higher uh, a greater power that your simple act of your will is not able to by itself come up with the righteousness and your heart is being patterned and groomed and conditioned to cry out to God for deliverance and you're being your heart is being schooled that righteousness is not of yourself it's of God and so on well then that so you may be doing something in the flesh that's not scriptural, and you're even conscious it's not scriptural. But now the hypocrites in heart, as Job said, the hypocrites in heart keep up wrath. wrath. Yeah, there's a hypocrite of flesh and a hypocrite of heart. And there's it's different. And I, I, I was challenged a number of times, a number of different people about, um, you know, being a, a murmurer. Yeah, neither murmur ye. Some of them murmured, and that's a that's a valid admonition. Right? Yeah, right. Neither murmur ye. Some of them murmured and were destroyed of the, whatever the destroyer. The destroyer. Right. Uh, but now, uh, it's it, it's just kind of a catchy phrase or whatever. Uh, and I'm saying this in reference to being a hypocrite in heart. Mm -hmm. Like the Bible says, like when we're Christians and we don't know the fullness of God's purpose. And we haven't really settled into the fellowship of his sufferings or, or, or that sort of thing. And we're learning that, uh, you, you know, that there, there's hardness and your hardness is good soldiers of Christ. And, and we, we're hoping for, for things to happen and they don't happen right away because God's trying our faith. And then hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. And then sometimes when your heart is sick, you kind of fret against the Lord. Well, I thought you were going to do this. I thought you were going to do that. I thought you would deliver me. I thought you'd heal me. I thought things would go better. I thought my brother would you know, love me more or whatever. Whatever issue you have. And so, uh, where was I going with that? Yeah, yeah so those things, uh, they'll play on your mind and everything else. And then you become a murmurer. You, you, be, you become a murmurer. But then as you, if you follow on to know the Lord, if you go on and God deals with you, you, you realize that... Uh, you know, there's no issues against God. You, you shouldn't be murmuring. You shouldn't be com complaining. Uh, and uh, and you eventually your heart gets converted and turns mm -hmm. back to God. And one of the promises of God in the Bible, is, is, in Isaiah, is that they that erred in spirit shall come to understanding, and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. Shall learn doctrine. Right. Mm -hmm. But the hypocrites in heart heap up so what would you rather be, a hypocrite or a murmurer? <laughs> if you had to be one or the other, I'd rather be the murmurer rather than the hypocrite. So, you know, that's my answer. If the, if the hypocrites call me a murmurer... I guess so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, especially on the... And again, this is not to excuse sin, but as many as have not known the depths of Satan, some people to get the keys of knowledge and understanding of what binds people up, God will exercise them through a depth of, of evil to have first-hand experience, then they overcome and recover themselves, and then they have the keys. They, okay, this, is why you, this is why you're bitter. This is why you can't let go of your bitterness. This is the key. This is the keys. The keys of knowledge. The keys are knowledge, right? Woe to you lawyers who withhold the keys of knowledge jesus went down to hell where did jesus get the keys to death he had to go down to hell and get the keys yeah i've had to go into my own little hell of bitterness to get the keys to find out you know what unlocks the soul to set a soul free that you can be free indeed and all that well when we and we're dealing with it all uh one of the keys is uh victim mentality you'll stay forever locked up in bondage if you may if you cultivate the victim mentality you'll always be in bondage you cannot consider yourself a victim as a Christian. Uh, and psychology has done a great, great damage in this front. Uh, 
2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2 talks about, Now this know in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their selves. And this is the generation that has more than any generation promoted, cultivated love of self. Okay, uh, we were talking at Stana's documentary on a video, and I saw it. Ed Bernays was the nephew of, uh, what, Sigmund, Sigmund Freud, Freud, and he was instrumental in introducing uh, influences into advertising and into culture and society, which, which cultivated uh, selfishness. The BBC did a documentary called yeah. Century of Self, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's those, it's, it's basically psychology that has uh, fast, really uh, propagated this idea, helped people to become absorbed in themselves, self-centered, lovers of themselves, so on and so forth. Um, psychology techniques and psychology approaches, uh, for the most part, culture, this sort of thing. Um, I read a book uh, quite a while ago. I still have it, and I may revisit some things in it. It was a ca Canadian woman psychiatrist who left the profession because her conclusion, and not even being a Christian, she wasn't even a Christian, her conclusion was psychiatry and psychology was producing people who considered themselves victims and which made them uh, more dysfunctional and useless in society. And she thought it was a very destructive influence. It was, it was actually creating victims out of people, making them think they're victims. Okay, you know, you know this classic kind of uh, scenario of the psychologist that he's sitting on his, uh, whatever, his lazy boy chair and... And you're laying down on the couch telling him your life story. Well, Doc, you know, it all began when I was a little child and my dad used to yell at me and, and whatever. Psychoanalysis and you, trying to revisit all these things that happened to you way back when. And uh, unfortunately, for the most part, all it does is it helps you to put a, an unhealthy, uh, destructive, excessive focus on yourself. <laughs> Basically... And you revisit all these things and you just give it a reinforcement in your soul, a reinforcement in your psyche. So not only, it's, you know, and that's in a nutshell. Uh, this, this lady dealt with a, a psychological technique or something, some phenomena that they, they, they dubbed it, they, they tagged it as a, a reco recovered memory therapy or something, where supposedly... Uh, people who had forgotten things, they recover a memory, they, 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 they try to go back and recover a memory that caused them to be traumatized and so on and so forth. Well, and all that kind of stuff uh, just had uh, negative effects. Absolutely. Negative effects. Um, so this is the century of self, this is the generation of selfishness, iniquity. Iniquity, yes, we're... we're we were um, rehearsing, how do you define iniquity? We were talking earlier about it before you came. We are just sort of sitting around, rapping, discussing things. Iniquity is lawlessness is one thing. Mm -hmm. law, no law. Well, you can chalk that up to the uh, Western philosophy, or the United States philosophy of uh, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, civil, individual liberties, and rights. As we said before, if you have a right, what we're saying is, is that you have the power, right? If you're saying, I have a right to marry uh, the same sex in marriage, if that's what you're saying, then you're saying, that, well, I have the power to do that. I should have the power to do that. So as soon as you say rights, as soon as you assert individual rights, you're destroying the purpose of God right at its foundations. Because we only have one right. To as many as received him, then he gave the power or the right to become the sons of God. Really, God created you. You're born in sin, shaped in iniquity. Your sin put him on the cross. And what do you have a right to? You know, in the purpose of God, if that's what we believe. What do we have a right to? We don't have a right to anything, right? So, uh, while, uh, and they're all saying that this is some sort of uh, God-given, inalienable right. rights. They say it comes from God. It's a perversion of what's supposed to be Christian liberty. If they take the concepts, concepts and precepts of liberty that the Bible talks about and pervert them to say everybody has a right to do what they want. 
Well, what, what have you just done? You've just liberated iniquity. If I have a right to do what I want, you do not have a right to tell me what to do. Right. <laughs> I've just undermined all hierarchy and authority mm-hmm. right at its foundations. Now, I mean, I, there's still, to a degree, hierarchy and authority and things that exist in society and culture. But fundamentally speaking, if I have a right, you can't tell me what to do. Yeah. Where, where's authority then? I mean, if you want to take that as far as you can take it, it will end up in anarchy. You don't believe me? Look at the far left. They're saying, defund the police. Mm-hmm. No, let's get rid of authority. Yeah. Let everybody live in anarchy. It's, it's totally wicked and evil and completely, totally destructive. And that's our generation, mm-hmm. full of selfishness. selfishness. Yeah, right. So anything that puts your focus on yourself, you should be aware of it. Such as uh, people who think that um, the American way is some kind of God-given thing. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Really, God said to us, or Jesus said to us, uh, give up all that you have, pick up your cross, deny yourself. And the United States uh, philosophy of life is saying, pursue your happiness. Think about yourself. you know, or Love yourself, in other words. Lovers of themselves. You see why... Men have become lovers of themselves. This is how it's happened in our generation. The influence of psychology, the influence of uh, Western philosophy of life, the United States, the American dream, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, civil liberties. That has all done nothing but but completely explode iniquity onto the into the world. So, love lovers of self. It's describing the general condition. Of loving yourself, okay, yeah, just being occupied with yourself. This is the problem, and this is the same problem with where you draw this fine line, this fine line between um, resenting. Which remember, when we talk about bitterness, resentment is close a word closely related to bitterness. But bitterness is a state you're in. Resentment is actually a motion where you relive the bitter experience. You call it to remembrance. And every time you call a bitter experience back to remembrance, you run the risk of giving it the deeper, firmer, branded impression on your heart, which then gives it a deeper root, which makes it even harder to get out. Yeah, it's, it's, it's harder to get out. Right. So, I mean, the Bible says, cast your care one on another, and, you know, you want to, sometimes you, we call this venting off, you're, you're upset, and you want to vent off on somebody, someone did you wrong, or something happened, and you don't like it, so you vent off, right? right. Well, are you venting off, or are you, re, are you strengthening your own bitterness? Are you justifying your own bitterness? Are you reliving it and strengthening the issue in your own soul? If you go either way, like, you know, it's, it, take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Well, you know, if I see, they're like, well, I got to get this off my chest so it doesn't remain here, you know, so it doesn't eat me up. I'm going to vent it off from you. Um, when I vent it off, well, did you vent it off? Did you leave it there? Yeah. Or or the next day are you rehearsing it again? You see? Yeah, you get somebody on your side. Right, exactly. <laughs> so you got to be careful how you go about this kind of venting off and mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Okay. So psychology is nurtured, promoted, and supported supported a generation of dysfunctional people, almost childish, almost bordering on childish and infantile, promoting the notion, reinforcing, standing behind the fact that, oh, yeah, we're all victims, we're all victims. Mm -hmm. You just just don't want to do that. We were talking last week about blind Bartimaeus. He was a victim. He's blind. Oh, he's a poor guy who was a victim, born blind, and so he had a, he had a, a robe, from the government that gave him the authority or the right to beg, to be a beggar. You know, when you're a victim, you, you're begging for pity, you're begging for comfort, you're begging for whatever. You, you become a beggar, a, a beggar. And God does not want us to be a subject to these beggarly elements. elements. Right. He wants you to ask, maybe plea, beseech, yeah. but not grovel and beg. Right. Give us this day our daily bread. Yeah. Okay, psychology is promoting and nurturing and justifying the exercise of self-analysis, self-reflection, self-awareness, self-fulfillment, self-happiness. Well, you see where we're going there. Self, 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 self. self. Okay, and you can take it right back to the garden. When Adam and Eve were in harmony and fellowship with God, 
every everything they were to do and their communion, every, everything they were looking to God. They were who were they aware of? God. They're aware of God. Amen. Well, they were na- they didn't know they were naked. Yeah. They're just totally caught up with God. You think you see Jesus Christ in His glory? Yeah. You think you're gonna worry or think or care about anything else? His His glory is gonna completely consume you, uh, fill right you, yeah. and you're gonna be so raptured, caught up with it. John got a glimpse of it. He fell down as a dead man. Well, and that's how God's going to wipe right. every tear from your eye. Right, exactly. It's going to be so overwhelming that everything else will just... Fear <laughs> not. Fear not, John. So, Adam and Eve are in the garden, but then when they fell, they're separated from God. All of a sudden, God's not there to be aware of. Right. By default, where did the awareness fall? Yeah. Self. They became aware of themselves. Self. See, that is the fundamental state of iniquity. Yep. Aware of self. Thinking yep. about self, concerned about self, afraid about self, self, right. self, self. I've been a victim. Self, self, yep. self, self. To protect themselves. Amen. Now we all need a, we all need to gradually grow out of this. I, no one's going to snap their fingers or anything. And even having said all that, there are issues people need to be pitied for and everything else. But mm-hmm. I'm just saying, as a rule here, or as a as a principle, you don't want to do anything to cultivate. Feeling like you're a victim. Mm-hmm. Um, in this book I read, this psychiatrist had uh, many people that she uh, dealt with, I guess, and she said some of among her 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 best uh, among the people that best coped and overcame really what we would call real traumas. One of them was an Iranian woman who was a Christian. Now I don't know to what extent she was really a Christian in, in this book from the psychiatrist. She said that she was a Christian. So she had some kind of profession of Christianity. And obviously it was enough that they got persecuted because they killed her husband over Christianity. And she was seeing the psychiatrist. And she said, I don't really want to stay here long. I just want to, uh, I have a, I don't remember exactly. She had some minor reasons why she wanted to consult once or twice with the psychiatrist. And um, the psychiatrist found out that she recovered much better than most people because she refused to cast herself as a victim. She ascribed it to the plan and providence of God that this is what had to happen. Uh, And then, of course, this is a Canadian psychiatrist. Uh, 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 Other things she said, and I won't get specifically into it, but that the Canadian government... Uh, at certain certain uh, tragedies or catastrophes in Canada, one was an airplane crash in Nova Scotia where everybody died, and uh, another one was a I don't know what it was, but you, you think of calamities, and they would send in you know grief counselors, and they would they would uh, give fr- ten free psychology sessions to everyone who has been traumatized and everything else, and uh, it didn't do any good. Yeah, to make right. a long story short, it didn't do any good. They, and they, they, their studies, you just have to take my word for it, there's their studies that show even in terrible traumas, like in an airplane crash, or let's, let's, say, uh, let's say you're in an airplane crash and most of the people die and you're, you're involved with it. If you just leave the people alone and don't make them try to recall events and all of this stuff, that their, their, trauma, their feelings of trauma go into remission in about two weeks. Just naturally, wow. in about two weeks' time, they start getting back on with life and right. with no counseling, no attention being drawn to the to the trauma. Right. So you want to be really, really careful how much attention you try to draw to the things you think you've been victimized by. It's, it's going to backfire. And what? And then to give it scriptural support, I better give it some scriptural support. You know, what does the Bible say? Forgetting those things that are, uh-huh. and reaching forth unto those things that are, you know, too much time spent in regret and concern and consumed consumed in the things of past, and you cannot, you're you're not at liberty to, whatever, take advantage or or to respond, and to capture whatever opportunity God is sending before you, like, right now. So, in other words. What does the psychology do then in psychiatry by all of this exercise? It is sensationalizing the victim 
mentality. I quoted the scripture in Luke 14 yesterday. That uh, what was it? Um, you know, come, come. To, I'm having a wedding feast. Come, everything's ready. Come to the feast. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. Now I know that in the scripture there it says one said I have a piece of ground and I have to yep. prove it. Another one said uh, yep. I have a yoke of oxen or what have you. And then the other one said, Oh, I've married a wife and I cannot come. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to depart from that to a certain degree. I'm not going to. I'm going to say something that may not seem to fit that exactly, but it's it's applicable. This is the single consent among the world or people who neglect or reject God. The single, the singleness of consent, is their bitterness, their victim mentality. Often, that is the single consent of people, and they try to find solace in other people that are victims, like they were victims, and they 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 seem to achieve a a, a temporary sense of of uh, um, relief or what have you, but it doesn't heal the soul, it doesn't save the soul, and uh, if if I'm uh, if I'm bitter against a woman who cheated on me, and I get together with other men whose wives cheated on them, and we all have camaraderie and fellowship, we're all just strengthening each other's bitterness, and that's human compassion. One gall of bitterness relating to another gall of bitterness, and identifying with it, and feeling okay for a while, never never going home healed or anything. Uh, healing is something, the healing of the soul is something that we have to allow. We have to let it. You know, we have to let it. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock, right? And that's why I'm saying victim mentality is something that you begin to you begin to embrace your wounds. You begin to count it as a valuable thing. You begin to like it and cultivate it and obsess on it because it gives me the right to be angry. It gives me the right to 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 uh, you know go out and to a wild party. It gives me the right yeah. to get drunk and yep. whatever. It gives me a right to seek my pleasure because mm-hmm. I need to be comforted because I'm a victim and mm-hmm. see and all that stuff is just destructive to the soul. As I said, if we're really in Him, we're complete, right? Mm-hmm. I don't need any of that. Mm-hmm. Of course, we were relating it last week back to the, the pursuit of honor. All right, so maybe uh, I consider this about myself. Maybe. Maybe I've known the depth of bitterness to get the keys to bitterness. And of course, one of the one of the most important keys to any deliverance, any anything, is forgiveness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Forgiveness. Yeah. Right. That is a key. Mm-hmm. Forgiveness. Mm-hmm. If you're in the gall of bitterness, you have a grudge. How do you how do you let it go? You forgive them. Right. And you let it go. Amen. And we know that whole teaching, forgive and it shall be forgiven unto you. If you if you from your heart forgive not everyone his brother his trespasses, neither will my Father in heaven. Yeah, you know, forgiveness is the thing you gotta sow it. Yes. You gotta dwell on it, think about it. How do you do that? Well, blessed is he that considers the poor, consider their poverty. No matter how mean or vicious or um, reprehensible or horrific the offense is, they are very desperate human being and they are full of spiritual poverty and they have nothing they're so desperate father forgive them they're desperate and they don't even know what they're doing they don't understand the fullness of what they're doing blessed is he that that considereth the poor and also um jeremiah you know the scripture in jeremiah for the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it most people like that are just you look at the desperation of people, and when, of course, when you're desperate, you don't. Desperation is is causes you to act in a way that's rash and un. What's the word I'm looking for? Irrational, without thinking. You without thinking, rash, I guess. So that's desperation. Jealousy is similar. When jealousy, jealousy is the rage of a man. When you're in a rage, you're, you're not you're not doing anything in consideration. I mean, that's what I'm trying to say. In consideration, you're not considering things. Because you're consumed in the moment of rage. Or if you're desperate, you're consumed in the moment. The desperation has your faculties and your ability to make righteous considerations and judgments blocked. It's blocked. It's hindered. And, of course, psychology, of course, has become big business, too, like everything else. 
Psychology is the devil's counterfeit to dealing with the soul. Psyche is the Greek word for soul. Ology is the study of. Well, for a man to think he knows the depth of a human soul is just, he doesn't know it at all. He'll never get to the depths of it. Not, not like God can. So beware of this cultivating, sensationalizing things that are, are, uh, that make you feel like a victim. Because that's what happens. Just look at these, what they call the social justice warriors, SJWs. I don't know if you follow any of this political stuff. And, uh, they, they call, they call a lot of these far left people snow, snowflakes. Because they just, the, the least little thing offends them. Mm-hmm. Right? What's charity? Charity is not easily offended. Charity says, nah, I'm not a victim. Nah, I, I, you know, I won't let that affect me. I won't take that personally. Uh, you hear, you hear things, uh, like, uh, in California somewhere. California is a bad place in certain parts of California for this, this kind of mentality. This way liberal, anarchist kind of known if you, if I say, in other words, if I say uh, "Good morning, Stan," and you didn't want me to say "Good morning, Stan," I victimized you. You're a victim. I said "Good morning," and you didn't want me to, and so that they call that a microaggression. I aggressively attacked you with a microaggression because I said "Good morning" when you didn't want me to say "Good morning." I mean, are we serious? Is that that's almost yes. unbelievable? <laughs> that's how gone they are, right? Absolutely. Or, and I've heard things in the past, or the way kids were brought up, well, they're 16, 17 years old, and the friends, they're all graduating from high school, and they're, they're you know, upper class, well-to-do, affluent Californian families, and they got lots of money, and so one, one family, one mother and father buy their daughter a car for graduation present, mm-hmm. and the other girl, she doesn't get a car for a graduation present, so what does she do? Goes out and kills mom and dad. But you didn't get me a car for graduation. And you see how perverted things become? Yeah, well, let's let this serial killer off the hook. The poor guy, uh, you know, he's a victim. You know, he, he, he didn't get enough brown M&Ms when he was a five-year-old. And his mother wouldn't buy him anymore. The poor guy, he was traumatized. And that's the reason why he killed these 32 people. I'm, I'm sensationalizing it to make a point. But you see all these kinds of miscarriages of, ju- of justice? It's all based on this. If you let somebody off the hook who shouldn't be off the hook, I guarantee you it's a based on the fact that, oh, well, he was insane, or he was a victim, or he was... It's all based on this perverted victim mentality stuff. Well, there might be places to apply that, but it's like anything else. Right. These are spiritual principles of judgment and justice, and the carnal man can't, can't do it. Right. He, he, he just, he's going to call good evil, evil good. Someone jaywalks and that's it. No more. We're in, we're in the three strikes, you're out rule. You're jaywalking, life in prison, you know, whatever. You, you hear all these miscarriages of justice all the time. Uh, I'm going to read something. Uh, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 13 on, on charity. This is just a, a rehearsed thing. You know, charity, we're being corrected God is long suffering, right? He's slow in ang- uh, slow in ang- anger, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. Long suffering is one of the fruits of the spirit. The Bible says, uh, "Reprove and rebuke with all long suffering." So, yes, there is there is a procedure, if you will, that that God goes through, then that that we go through. Uh, but we are going to be corrected, yeah, even if you bit. don't know. He that knew not His Lord's will and did not. Even in your ignorance, you didn't know it was God's will, and you, so you didn't do it. You shall be beaten right. with a few, few stripes because you didn't know. So there is there is a, a mitigating factor there. That's the way judgment is. But he who knew his Lord's will and did not mm-hmm. shall be beaten with many stripes. No, well, I'm going to categorize two things. I'm going to separate two things: uh, transgression and iniquity. For, for a reason, because I'm going to bring a scripture into it. There's transgression. I'm going to call, for, for now, I'm going to call transgression the deeds and the actions that are wrong. Transgression. And as we're talking about iniquity, let's revisit that. Iniquity is 
the state of being selfish, self-centered, it's lawlessness, right? If I'm if I am self-centered, I do everything for myself, by myself, in reference to myself. It stands to reason then that I'm I'm not subject to a law. I'm subject to what I think. It's like the book of Judges, uh, when every man did what was right in their own eyes. So, well, let's call transgression the uh, action or the deed that's wrong, and let's call iniquity the selfish, self-centered, evil, spiritual motion within that produced that, that act, that motivated it. The state of being bitter, the state of being selfish. That's the iniquity. That's what inspired it. And even David said, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. So my sin was a misdeed, but the iniquity of it was the contrived, you know, scheming, whatever, selfish, jealous, wicked, angry, whatever, spiritual motion that produced that act. He's saying, wow, God even forgave that, the iniquity of my sin. Selah, think about that. Selah. All right, so then when we talk about correction, we were talking earlier, I thought of the scripture, so I wanted to bring it up. He, he, uh, it talks about uh, the sure mercies of David somewhere, I think Psalm 89. And it says, uh, you know, uh, he says, I've chosen David, I've anointed him with my holy oil, and I swore to him by my holiness and everything, and his not fail of his children to sit upon the throne of Israel. And he said, now if his children break my commandments and don't keep my statutes. Mm-hmm. He said, I will visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Right. So I always made, I read that one day and I made the distinction. Wow. Okay, he'll rule them, rule them with a rod of iron. Okay, mm-hmm. and iron is like flesh. Like we're, we're called out of the iron, for, iron furnace. So it's, when we do misdeeds in the flesh, we're going to reap in the flesh. Absolutely. Right? That's the rod. Mm-hmm. Our transgression, our misdeed in the flesh, is visited with the rod, a consequence in the flesh. Mm-hmm. But you still have to deal with the iniquity. And what deals with the iniquity is the stripes. Mm-hmm. The stripes are the reproach, the shame, the guilt, the self-loathing, the, all that stuff. The, the pain of the soul, that, that is the stripes. The blueness of a wound cleanses away evil. So also stripes, the inward part of the belly, the iniquity that's down there. It's God's reproach on me, reproving me for my selfishness. It's going to make me abhor myself, not want to be selfish anymore, you know. It's like, and, and when we talk about charity, like we're not even free to express charity until we ourselves have been made whole, right? It's like even us, God, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And while we're yet sinners, God loves us. Um, and we love God because he first loved us. It always takes the, the perfect or the more perfect vessel to love somebody first so that they can be Cleansed, healed, healed, made whole. So once they're made whole and they are complete and they don't need anymore and they're not the victim anymore and they, you don't have to cater to them anymore. Now they are free to express love down to the next vessel. And it comes down like that. You know, every good and perfect gift comes down. So it's got to start with someone partly perfect or, or perfect like God. Like if God didn't decide to love us first, that's it. We're game over. We'd never be saved. So our part of the, our pursuit is first we sanctify ourselves from the world's ways and the world's activities. Mm -hmm. We kind of present our bodies, if you will. We get our bodies out of ungodly activities. We stop exposing our bodies to ungodly influences, media. But then next we're we're cleansing and sanctifying our hearts, Mm -hmm. purifying our hearts by faith, but we're sanctifying our hearts so that we can be whole so that the love of God has a free course through us. Otherwise, we're occupied with ourselves. We're consumed with ourselves. We're self-centered, right? If I'm busy trying to tend to myself, well, I don't have the resources to tend to others, do I? Or not as well. But if I have no need, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. 
I'm complete in Him. I'm content. I have peace. I have love. I have hope. I have uh, faith, hope, and charity. Right? I'm complete. I'm then the love of God can be expressed. And that's the basis of these fundamental things of bitterness and charity. Uh, the gall of bitterness bonds you to iniquity. Charity is the bond of perfection. Mm-hmm. Remember, when Jesus talks about perfection in Matthew 5, 6, or 7, or the Beatitudes, he says it right after he uh, he expounds about loving your enemies. He's, he's saying be perfect in reference to charity. In other words, be therefore perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. For he reigns on the just and on the unjust. He's, you know, he's... All right, so 1 Corinthians 13, we all know it. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, and as per someone's request, I'm going to read it more slowly. Some people were requesting that I read more slowly. Because I, if I get talking and I think i got a lot to say, I feel like i got to blah, 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 read through the Scriptures fast. I'll try to slow down. Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not charity, I become as sounding brass, tinkling cymbal. Mm-hmm. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, the profit of me, nothing. It's pretty astounding, huh? You can do all these things in the wrong motives, the right outward, outward deeds. Well, what about philanthropists? There are men who will have billions and billions of dollars and they become philanthropists. Are they philanthropists because they love God or do they, just, do they want to leave their mark in the world and they want to be known as the great benefactor of... of the MacArthur Foundation, the Bill... There you the go. Exactly. You know, whose image and superscription is on this life? So, exactly. Yeah. Bill Gates named or what have you. Or even the ministries that go by the names of the ministers instead of the name of the church, which is Jesus. And you have not, it's not done by, by charity, right? So it's just, again, it can be, be done in iniquity in a self serving way. Just like the people who say, Lord, did we not cast out devils? Look, well, look at what we did. Look at what we did. Mm-hmm. And I've been admonishing for the last year or so here and there on a regular basis don't keep a scorecard of your religious accomplishments. Because the people who did the greatest works for God are Matthew 25 folks who said, Lord, when did we see you naked and covered, clothed you? When did we see you in prison? When, did we, when were you hungry and, and we fed you? When, when did this happen? So here they are, those people, they, did, they weren't keeping a score of card. In fact, the mighty works of God were occurring through them and they weren't even conscious of it. It was just because it was the natural flowing nature of charity. Jesus says, come, answer, enter right? in. Yeah. So I'm I'm very leery about anybody who holds right. up their their little uh, religious scorecard. Oh, we had a crusade and 25 people got saved. Oh, mm, I don't know. I wouldn't do that. So you can do all that religious work and not have charity, right? It, it's an actual work of idolatry, is what it is. It's seeking its own reputation, leaving a mark on the world that's related to the pride of life, and using the gifts of God to accomplish it. Though I give my body to be burned. Really? Give your body, be burned? Have not charity, it profits me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own. That's what we've been talking about all night. If you're a victim, then you're needy. You need consolation. You need comfort. You need this. You need that. You need vindication. You need honor. You need... All kinds of things when you're the victim, and it turns you into a creature excessively seeking its own, or or has the potential to for that. As I said, if we're if we're reconciled to God, our awareness is Jesus, just like Adam and Eve's awareness was God. Their awareness was God. If you're separated, then by default the awareness is going to fall on to yourself. Rejoiceth not, okay, seeketh not our own is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. 
For when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For example, you might say victim mentality is the childish. For now we see darkly, through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these are charity. Okay, and so um, we've been called to liberty, but we don't use liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love, serve one another. So here's your Christian liberty. Your Christian liberty is free from your own uh, hang-ups and what, what not. A liberated soul, reconciled, complete in Christ, made one with God, and now you are at liberty to what? To love. You're at liberty to love. You know, if I'm all messed up in my gall of bitterness and I'm consumed with things and I, I'm... Here's another scripture. A fool has no delight in understanding, but that it may discover, its heart may discover itself. You think you're going to discover yourself? You know, you can't do that. And that's... I'm just talking about the preoccupation with self again. Uh, so, liberty is liberty from sin, liberty from the burden and the heavy laden guilt and burden and consuming of your own diseased soul, your own tormented soul. It's liberty from sin to serve by love. See the difference between that and the American idea of what liberty is? It's not life, liberty, and the pursuit of your happiness. That's a self-serving, self-seeking, iniquitous thing. Oh, all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. You know, walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The flesh lusts against the spirit, spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so you cannot do the things you would. If you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, <coughs> meekness, temperance against such there is no law and they that are christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts okay now i'm going to go through the checklist of first corinthians 13 quickly okay now charity is not easily provoked but charity can be provoked and it's better to dwell alone in the corner in the housetop than with a Wrong. odious woman Odious is the kind of thing where odious, odious is vexing to the point where it'll it'll draw a it'll draw a hateful reaction out of somebody who's generally not prone to be that way. It it is it's like a continual dripping, and and you don't know that until you're very intimate with it, like uh, you know. Three, one of the things your earth, earth heart can't bear is an od is you can't bear an odious woman when she is married, because now you're intimately subject to this this thing. But there is what I'm, what I'm going to be talking about here is what I want to make a point is is that it's not easily provoked, but it can be provoked. But we want to go through the whole progression of first exercising the long-suffering and exhausting all those things first. And it's just like uh, uh, we're talking about, um, it, it, it's, it's like if, if we have conflicts and everything else, you know, we try to be peaceable. Well, it's the first thing you should do is to try to be peaceable. Well, that may not work. So you may have to progress to other things. But this is what, what Charity is talking about. And to put it with one other scripture, reprove and rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine.
doctrine. Now, I do not conduct myself perfectly towards the hotel people out there, but there are times where I can see that I'm, I'm consciously trying to do certain things, and certain things uh, I feel justified in rising up and making some certain point against them. I, I point to them or against them. As I was telling you, when they try to interfere in, in how I do a job, and, and they're not qualified, and every time they, they have shown a pattern, a consistent pattern of they want to try to help me, and they stick their hands in here or stick their hands in there, and it's the wrong move. They're interfering. It can even be dangerous at times. Well, I've had people, I've had, I've been on the phone with tech support, fixing uh, commercial appliances with complicated electronic computer boards, and the machine is on, there's power to the board, and I'm talking, and we're taking, we're, we're taking tests of different points in the board, and this Indian guy reaches over, grabs my shoulder, and starts yanking wires on the board. Well, that's clearly out of place, right? If I suffer for a long time, people trying to interfere, and I try to gently back them off, and they keep compel they keep compelling to interfere and interrupt, and even if they're, like I said, even if their motive is good, they're just making the wrong move, and they're impulsive and compulsive about it, and they have no wisdom about it, then, then I'll, I'll raise my voice. And I actually did that last week, mm -hmm. backed her off. Yeah, absolutely. But what makes me clear to do it? I, I did all the long suffering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so the importance of that is that that makes that justifies the reproof or the rebuke, and it clears you in it. Mm -hmm. All right. Charity suffers long. Love of God disposes us to imitate Him and disposes us to such long suffering as He also manifests. The long suffering of God is very wonderfully manifest. And it's bearing innumerable injuries from men and injuries that are of great and long continuance. Mm -hmm. This is not mine. This is not mine. This is uh, some book I think Brother Doug gave me a long time ago. Yeah. Just, it sounds, yeah. It, and some of these may be a compilation of other preachers too. L love is kind. Such was the predominant. Such was the predominant. Such was predominantly the character of Christ's ministry which dispensed deeds of gentle kindness among the lowly and the needy with whom he came in contact. Well, the church in Proverbs 31, the church, it says that the law of kindness is okay, in, her it's in her tongue. So that's basically a woman, more of a womanly attribute. Mm -hmm. Now, we possess it as the church. We are the woman, right? Christ is the bride, groom, and we are the bride. Right. So... But bringing it back down to the genders and the roles in the marriage, it's predominantly the woman has more of the law of kindness. Mm -hmm. Charity envieth not. Envy defined as a spirit of dissatisfaction with and opposition to the prosperity and happiness of others as compared to yourself. It borders on jealousy, envious. There's no reason for us to be envy, envious, right? Yeah, amen. I mean, uh, it's like I said before, when we get to glory, uh, you know how the stars differ in glory. Yeah, yeah. Some stars are brighter than others. Mm -hmm. But in heaven, it's a continuous, perpetual, never-ending increase of glory. It's always increasing, always increasing. So if we're in heaven and I'm a star and I have a glory of five and a half and you're a star and you have a glory of eight... I say, man, I'm envious of him. He has a glory of 8. I only got a glory of 5.5. .5. Well, don't worry. The glory is increasing. In a short, I mean, it's eternity. It's not time. But you, you see, I'm just trying to make a point. Eventually, I'll know what the glory of 8 is. By that time, he'll have the glory of 10.5 or something. I don't have to envy that. You don't have to envy anybody who has more than you. They have more than you. More is required of them. You know, we're all working, right? What they all went and agreed to work in, in in the man's field. What did they all get? A penny. Yeah. Eternal life. And of course, we know when Jesus said in the Bible that uh, the things written concerning me have an end. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the end of Jesus Christ. It was the end of his apostleship, mm -hmm. the work that he did on earth. Mm -hmm. he, and his apostleship ended, and he became a high priest. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, if I'm a teacher, and my teacher, I'm going to end as a teacher. 
And I'm going to become a king and a priest unto God. Well, and so are you. It doesn't matter whether you're a saint, a teacher, an apostle. It doesn't matter what you are. You're going to get a penny. You're going to be a king and a priest. You're going to be what God told you to be. And there's going to be no envy. There's no reason for, for envy then in that, way, in that sense. And this is at, at the root of feminism. They, they're envious that like, men have more. They make more money. They do this. Half their arguments are, are not uh, able to be substantiated by true data. But the point is, there's no, it's like we said before, there's no berating or belittlement in someone being weaker or having less of something, right? I mean, I don't, I don't care if my van can carry three quarters of a ton of, of cement blocks, but my little Toyota can't, because my Toyota is different. It's weaker. It's a weaker vi- vessel, but it's not less important. Right? The Prius can parallel park downtown and the big van can't. You know, so what what you know what I'm saying? Like it's just where's envy? If you got the right mindset, where is envy? So charity doesn't envy. It's not comparing itself to others. Charity vaunteth not itself. It's not a braggart, it's not a windbag, it doesn't boast, it doesn't overestimate its own importance and abilities and achievements. You know, this is the issue we had with the overcomer ministry. It's one thing to manif- ma- magnify your office, and it's another to just excessively exaggerate your importance. Mm-hmm. There's a difference oh, yeah. between that. And that's why I say don't keep the scorecard. Don't boast of abilities and achievements. And mm-hmm. Charity is not puffed up. There are innumerable ways that pride can manifest overtly or subtly, and love is incompatible with them all. So love isn't puffed up. Now this, I always like this statement here. Love is concerned rather to give of itself rather than to assert itself. Love does not behave itself unseemly. Charity's behavior is not contrary to the form or fashion or manner that is proper. When pride puffs up, the heart unseemly... When the heart gets puffed up, unseemly and, and unbearable conduct naturally flow. Yeah, so uh, pride doesn't, or charity isn't, isn't, in other words, charity isn't here to show out, basically. And charity seeks not its own. And this is a really good one, too. And I, I, I brought this point up. Uh, well, I'll explain it in a sec. Love not, love does not, m- not merely does not seek that which does not belong to it, but it's also prepared to give up for the sake of others what it is actually entitled to. Now, Paul demonstrated this when he said, uh, you know, what man goes, what man goes a warfare at his own charges? What man doesn't plant a vineyard and eat some of his grapes, eat some of the grapes? And so now I've sown unto you all these spiritual things. I'm entitled to get some carnal things back from you. He said, but I have not used this power. Or this right. He had a right to do it. He had a power to do it. But I, but I have not used this power. Lest I would abuse the privilege or what? lest some think that I'm after money and I'm paraphrasing. But I, he, Paul said, but I strove to make the gospel of no charge. Now if he had it taken in that, in that season, if he had it taken, he wouldn't have been wrong. But charity was working in him to the point where he was giving up even what he was entitled to. Right, if we have sown into you spiritual things, it is a great thing. If we reap your carnal things, I think it's Romans 14. If others be partaker of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. So I didn't want any hindrance. No occasion for somebody to say, Ah, oh, Paul, look, he's a money grabber. Well, that's what charity does. And you know the other scripture, If meat makes my brother to fend. You know, one, one man who is weak eat herbs, the other one he eats meat. Well, my faith on a personal level may allow me to do a lot of things, but somebody else may be offended by it. And I'm not talking about sinful activities. Amen. But I'm just saying that charity would say, even though I'm entitled to a certain thing, 
charities, since it's not seeking its own, it's, it, it will forbear for the sake of not hindering the brother. It's just a characteristic of charity, further underscoring that charity is not going to seek its own. Oh, there was a certain study there where they studied, psychologists studied people that were um, in therapy talking about their problems and stuff. And they, they determined that among a certain type of people, there were, they had something like a, seven or eight percent of them had sort of suicidal thoughts and tendencies. After therapy, it went up to something asked like 50, 60 percent. You see, you get the point, right? You're just cultivating the evil and the self-centeredness and all of that. That's what you got to remember about that. Yeah, forget the things that are behind. Reach forth to the things that are set before. Okay, that's it. I'm done.